So, tell us that soccer is here. We want motive in mind to set things rolling, just like with a locomotive. Do you hear this walls coming down? Storytelling today to drive my points across. Now, something phenomenal happened during my practice days. I was on call on a Christmas day and a particular patient was brought in from Worry. How many of you know Worry in Delta State? I was the only house officer on call on that day. And, and it was a Christmas day, like I mentioned before. So you can imagine I was thinking about the rice and uh, the chicken I, I, I was going to miss. So unfortunately for the institution I was working in, we did not have a functional ventilator in the entire hospital. You know what a ventilator is. It helps you to sustain respiration when a patient cannot do it on his own. We had an intensive care unit that didn't have a single functional ventilator. Now, what used to happen was that house officers would be made to amble back patients manually for five to eight hours in turns. We're taking turns to do that, and we're doing it in silence. We didn't want the entire world to know. Now, in the emergency unit, in the emergency section, we had an anesthetic machine that could simulate or could, you, you, could, you could, in a way, make it act like a ventilator for a very short period of time. So when this patient was brought in, I knew we didn't have a ventilator. So I quickly called my superior because he had fallen from a height, he had fractured one of his one of the vertebral bones, you know, I don't want to go into the technical details. And he couldn't breathe on his own. So we had to put him on a ventilator. So I called my superior. They put him on the anesthetic machine because it was Shell. You know Shell, the oil giant? Shell brought him from Rory. And they had this fancy, techy ventilator that the guy was on, you know, for the trip. So they had to take their ventilator back. So we put the guy on, an, on the anesthetic machine and Shell left. So he was on that machine for a couple of hours, trans transferred to ICU, and I had to leave to go to ICU to amble back him for eight hours. In other words, for eight hours, I was just doing this. All right? Now, three days later, there was a clinical review. And during the clinical review, I heard that patient had died. Now, when I heard, because I knew his name, because I was with him for eight hours straight, so I I asked myself this question, could it be possible that somebody who was ambubagging for probably five to eight hours slept off? Now, he slept off, couldn't ambubag further, and the patient died. So right there in the clinical meeting, because as a medical student, I had an entrepreneurial mindset. I knew I wasn't going to practice medicine. House job was it for me. My future was already being planned and I was moving in that direction. So I didn't owe anybody any responsibilities. I wasn't going to beg anybody for residency in that hospital. So I had to speak out. So I put up my hand and I said something. And I was like, my distinguished consultants, my distinguished senior registrars and registrars, I would like to say that this is disgraceful. And instantly, all heads turned to the back. Because we're sitting at the back, I was a house officer. House officer sat at the back. So who is this bloody house officer who has the guts to tell us that what we are doing is wrong? So they looked at me and I talked with all confidence that look, the time has come for us to think innovatively. If the government is not providing ventilators for us, we have to think innovatively about how we can create solutions to this problem. Patients can't keep dying right here. And I was told to shut up and sit down. But I made my point. Now, would you say Nigeria is a chaotic nation? Yes, we will. All right? Um, how does the world see us? How do you think the world sees us? I'll tell you how. They see us with passionate disrespect. This was in Luxembourg. I'm the one sitting at the far corner, the only black man in that place. It's a global business meeting in, 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 in Luxembourg. It was hosted by the government of Luxembourg. 
and I was one of those invited to speak. But something happened the night before this happened. In fact, I didn't want to speak anymore because of the treatment I got on the streets of Luxembourg. I got into my hotel. I wanted to take a walk that night. I got in, I got in the evening. I wanted to take a walk to just see the city center. And I got to a bus station because I was tired. I needed to go back to my hotel. I met an American lady who was going to my hotel. So she was looking for directions. So she, while, we, while we got talking, she asked me, I asked her where she's from. She said she's from the United States. She asked me where I'm from. And that was the mistake. I said I'm from Nigeria. I have a loud voice. So immediately I said I was from Nigeria. There was a lady standing in front of me who immediately turned around and screamed out, Nigerians are criminals. You guys are terrible. And I was like, what is going on? Now I looked around. I was the only black man in the whole bus station. I looked around further. I was the only black man in the whole block. Now there's a white lady screaming criminal thief. Nobody's going to ask what exactly is she talking about. He's a criminal. He's a thief. And probably somebody from somewhere will call the cops on me or pull out a gun. So I assessed the situation thoroughly. Luckily for me, my passport, my invitation letter signed by the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg was in my pocket. So I pulled it. I, I, I gave the signal that I want to pull out something. I think I want to pull out a gun. I want to pull out something from my pocket. And I pulled it out and showed her the letter. And she looked at it and she calmed down. And then I wasn't calm. And I said, you don't call now. everybody you see in bus stations, thieves and criminals. I turned it up on her because I was really upset. And when I got back to my hotel, for the first time I felt black. This is a hotel I came in with all confidence. I didn't care who was there. But for the first time, I assessed the hotel. And there was this glass, um, transparent, whatever, you know, in front of the hotel. And you could see everybody inside. And I discovered that there was no black person sitting there. It took me like 10 minutes to get myself together. I got in. I didn't prepare for this summit anymore. Went to my room, shut down my laptop, slept till the next morning, went straight to the chairman of the event and told him that I wasn't going to participate. I wasn't feeling it. And he sat down, sat me down. We talked about it. And that was it. I, we ended up participating in the event and all that. But the truth of the matter is we are viewed by a lot of people around the globe with passionate disrespect. How many of us saw what happened in South Africa just a few weeks ago, a few months ago. It was terrible. It's the way we are seen. How many of us have heard about the Ghanaians deporting Nigerians and closing Nigerian businesses? It's the way we are seen. It's the way we have packaged our brand. This has to change. Now, just a few days ago, my driver was taking me for a meeting. It was just after the South African riots. And I, sat, I had to do something. We packed somewhere. I think it was a day after. And my driver told me, um, Doctor, please, I need to tell you something. I was like, what? He was like, yesterday, that was the day of the riots. He was coming to, um, he was passing through the airport road. You know there's a shop right around the, along that road. He was passing through there, and he said people, young guys, young energetic guys, wanted to stop the car and get him out and probably take the car or maim him. And for the first time, while he was saying that, I realized something. And, I, and as, I'm, as I'm looking at everybody here, you're all looking all good. You all look, your skin is looking fresh. And probably you came with a fantastic car here. Let me tell you something. If there is another trigger that angers the people, understand this. Those boys on the streets cannot have access to Jimovia. Jimovia has security around him. They won't go there. They can't have access to Tony Elumelu. They can't have access to Dangote. They don't have access to any governor who they think really steals money or, t or, or has raped them you know, of, of, of the resources and the, the opportunities they have or they should have had. Do you know who they will come after? They know where your kids are. They know where they school. They know the cars you ride. And, I, and after he said that, it dawned on me thoroughly that, look, our mentality as a group of people who, by one way or the other, we have certain privileges attached to our name, but we have worked for these privileges. We didn't steal money. 
We did, we're not part of those who looted the, the, the resources of this country. But the truth of the matter is, when, it, when push comes to shove, those boys will not be asking those questions. They will pull you out of your Prado Jeep and they will slice your throat. So we have to do something now, and I mean now. Now, most of us, our parents told us, I mean, your parents told you that when you, you, know, you go to school, you, know, you, you, you read a good course, there's a job waiting for you, um, everything will be all nice and, and, and great, right? Stand out in the global community of nations. But there are three levels you can see on this, on this slide, all right? Natural endowments, macroeconomic competitiveness, and microeconomic competitiveness. Now, a country like Nigeria is still competing at the natural endowments level. All right? In other words, we find oil, all we just do, we sign contracts with people that we will take the oil from the ground and sell it and we make money. All right? We, we, we say we want to diversify into agriculture. All we are thinking about is how to plant enough, put that in the ground, and sell it off. No value added. All right? So we're still competing at the natural endowments level. Nigeria is an example. Venezuela is an example. A lot of other countries are still competing at that level. Way back in 2001, in the 90s, he talked about the transition from the old model to the new model. And that is where your role now comes in. In the old model, it was like government drives economic development through policy decisions and incentives. It was all about government. It was all, what, all about what government could do. That is why your parents told you that when you graduate, government will provide a job for you. Government will do this. This road is bad. Don't worry, my son. Very soon, the government will come and do it. People are, being, people are losing jobs, don't, don't worry, the government will provide jobs. That is what we heard. But the new model, which has become more evident even today, is that economic development is a collaborative process involving government at multiple levels, companies, teaching and research institutions, private sector organizations, and outcome-driven nation builders. I added that. This is Professor Michael Porter's slide. It's not my slide. Prof, if you see this slide on YouTube, I gave you credit. All right? Now, I added, this is mine, outcome-driven nation builders. You know, um, yeah. And I would explain what that means. Who are outcome-driven outcome nation builders? They are passionate, organized social innovators aggregated around a common goal. Now, I'll tell you the story about a party I went to. I'll soon round up. A, a friend of mine whose father is a billionaire, I went to have a meeting with him, and he just told me his birthday was the next day. So he invited me, so I said, okay, I'll come. That day I had a meeting, so I knew I, I, I could just spend like 10 minutes in that place and get out. So my driver took me to his estate. I got in there, I just told my driver, keep the engine running, I'm not, I'm not spending too much time, I just want to show my face and get out. So when I got in, just a few friends, a few friends of his, they were having a conversation, eating and all that, you know, very light music. And the conversation was going on. Now, the conversation was about the state of Nigeria. Okay, so when I, when I got in, I, I listened to the conversation a bit. I was like, where's, where's this guy? Let him see my face. So I, he saw me, we had, a, we had a chit chat, but he insisted I, I sat down, you know, had something to eat. You know, and that was going on. So I listened more to the conversation. And they were talking about the power problem about in Nigeria, and how it was affecting their businesses. They were all big boys in that room. So they were talking about the power problem, how it affected their businesses, how it's affecting their bottom lines, and all that, their productivity, and all that. I, I wasn't saying a word. I didn't contribute at all. So somebody noticed I wasn't saying something, and said, ah, excuse me, why are you not saying anything? Are you a Buhari boy? And I was like, what? Why would you say that? He was like, because you're not saying anything. We're talking about the power problem and you have not even said a word. And I kept quiet. So my guest, who was the one who pushed my buttons, was like, he noticed exactly the same thing the day I came to his house, where he talked about a national problem and I didn't say anything. <laughs> I knew there wasn't. We had a partnership with Daily Trust to do the third edition. I refused to do it because I'd heard enough. It was just, I, I, I don't build talk shops. I had heard enough, now strategy two. What's the next thing in line? It had to be alternative power generation. That's the only way Nigeria can leapfrog. So do you know what I did? I thought about this for, for, for months after my last event, thought about it. I drew, I'm not an engineer, I drew a setup in my phone, I use a note, in, uh, a Samsung Galaxy Note, 
I, was, I asked myself, can, can electricity be generated from water? And I got into YouTube. I found a young man called Emeka Nelson. Have you heard his name? I found a young man called Emeka Nelson, found him on Facebook, sent him a message that I wanted to meet with him. Because I was having a meeting with the Minister of State for trade and investment at the time, um, the former minister just before, the, before this current one. I wanted to take a group of young innovators and expose them to the government because they were within my circle of influence. I could do something about it. So I, I called the minister that, look, I am bringing certain people and I'm bringing the media. I want to expose their innovation. So I called the Mika Nelson and another guy who built a drone. Now, this is um, a timeline between 150 BC and 1999. Now imagine you were stranded on an island in 150 BC and you needed to let people understand that you were there so they could come and save you. At, during, at 150 BC, what's the only method you could deploy to get noticed? What? Fire and smoke. Good. Now, around 1670, the megaphone was, you know, the, the innovation called the megaphone was created. So if you are stranded on that island, you won't be thinking about smoke anymore. What would you be thinking about? The megaphone. Around 1940 to 1999, you now started having something, the transformation process now started going towards, you know, what we now have, you know, our mobile communication technologies and all that. But the truth of the matter is this. The method has changed over the years. But has the need, the outcome, changed? No. The outcome that is sought by anyone in that island is to communicate in a dangerous situation. Brands always change, but the outcome always remains the same. Now, we, we, we deploy certain brands, just like those, just, just like those other brands, was this slide. A problem statement has an object of control, which is to confirm receipt. Can you imagine if Facebook had one global strategy towards healthcare? Can you imagine the level of impact? Facebook has a strategy to bring, to connect people. It doesn't have a strategy for social impact. Are we together? Now imagine if Facebook of two billion people decided that going forward, the two billion people on our network will just be transforming hospitals across the globe from third class to world class. We'll mobilize resources, mobilize people, and every week, the entire two billion people on Facebook will be targeting the transformation of hospitals across the world. Can you imagine the level of impact? That is what we're trying to create. And I, and I, and I, and I, and I, I, I will enjoin you to start thinking differently about this nation because when push comes to shove, when the next South African experience happens, God forbid, nobody will find Tony Elumelu, nobody will find Jimovia. They will find you in your Prado jeeps, your nice houses, they know where your children school, they know where you eat, they know your movement, they drive you, they're your make gods, they will find you. Thank you.